delighted to be able to introduce um, two of our speakers today. When the Ashmolean Museum reopened, it was really wonderful to note that the whole curating and organization of the museum was structured around the notion of crossing cultures and global citizenship. Lynn Bibbings also um, champions global citizenship um, within the business school and also um, um, as seconded to the Higher Education Academy. Paul and Lynn have begun dialogue um, to look at how they might work together. Um, to open the dialogue by asking you how the notion of global citizenship has been perceived and how you are using that concept to shape your communities, your two different communities. Paul, do you mind well, if you could kick off with that? Well, thank you. Um, well, I was in, in a very lucky position in a way because most museums, particularly those that explore a variety of cultures, um, have grown organically as a result of history, um, 19th, 20th century origins, and the thinking behind the organisation of the material in the museum has not always been at the forefront. And when the Ashmolean was rebuilt, literally, um, starting in 2006 and then opened in 2009, the concept behind the relationship with the galleries was about the relationships of cultures through time. So the museum as it now stands, in a sense, was trying to lay out a global perspective through both space and time, so that you can come in the front door and enter antiquity, as it were, the ancient world, and move from the world of Asia through to the world of Europe in an uninterrupted sequence, and see how cultures um, are expressed through their connections as much as by their differences. And that was really the great excitement, I think, in thinking about then the galleries themselves independently, how you start to weave those stories of connectedness um, through the entire building. And I came to um, global citizenship partly because the university had decided to move to talking about um, graduate attributes. And global citizenship is one that we look at all those things as being important. And I started to think about this a lot more, um, both in terms of helping um, faculty of business to start to think about it. And I know some people were doing just session just now and talked about that, but more particularly in my own subject area of tourism. And tourism, of course, is something which is a bit of a global project anyway, and where issues about sustainability and values and responsibility are ones that have been rehearsed for some considerable time, but actually are quite contested and certainly in relation to tourism businesses are things that um, are, are contested and are challenged in terms of um, how genuine, authentic their commitment to any of that is. Um, and so my, my approach has been to start to think about working with students on um, a range of modules that I teach, but in particular two modules. One is about um, sustainable destination development and the other is about festival, festivals and cultural events. And I started to think about how I could do this with students. And I'd be very interested to hear other people's approaches about how they're engaging with students and finding out what they think about all of this. In that um, my approach has been very much one of this being a joint project with my students to explore what we all think about global citizenship within the context of the subject, whereas I think a lot of what this has been, has been talked about today has, has been a bit decontextualised and this is very much embedded within actually how they think about their disciplinary um, knowledge and, and understanding. And um, one thing in particular is about how they see that thread, which I think is, is 
can be really important in, um, in your conversations about how you think about the past, the present, and envisioning the kinds of futures that we might want to construct in this globalised world that we're, that we're living in and maybe contracting from. So, um, when Paul and I first had a, a conversation, we started to share some of these ideas. And what started to come out was this, linking to what um, Martin was saying earlier, this sort of de-layering of, of different ways of thinking about what we, what we had done and what we had as our individual institutional projects, if you like. So, um, in particular, we started to talk about our audiences, participants, the visitors, whatever we describe them as, and the different kinds of meanings that um, what we were doing would, would have for each of those audiences. I just wondered if you would say something a bit about that now. That's, that was that's quite important for yeah, us, where you are, isn't it? Well, I mean, certainly, I mean, the one aspect I, I found absolutely extraordinary when we started talking, I, mean, I, I don't know about you, but I began thinking, you know, would we be speaking the same language, in a sense, <laughs> from two completely different backgrounds, yeah. disciplines? Um, and, and the remarkable thing is we, we were saying exactly the same thing, in mm -hmm. a way, particularly with that notion of tourism. Yeah. Um, because, of course, we think of the museum as a destination for tourists, which is certainly where we, we start as curators, building displays for tourists to come in and understand these ancient societies, this ancient world. But then it became very clear, I think, in our conversation that, in fact, of course, these ancient <coughs> cultures, in a sense, that we're, we're viewing are the destination themselves. We're, we're creating uh, countries, nations, worlds, that people will have to try and understand as much as they have to try and understand if they travel from yeah. here to Egypt, um, whether they're traveling in reality or just traveling to the museum space. Mm. And the job of the curator, of course, is to try and create that world. And does the visitor come with a perceived idea of what that world is, through television or through travel? Mm and one then informs the other. And does that drive then the curator to create something that's expected or challenge that view through scholarship or interpretation, which may or may not be right? Yes. And so you're creating worlds that the tourist, in a sense, visits. Yes. And, I mean, the other fascinating thing was about that, when we started to think about it, was that this museum was almost you know, encapsulated so many of those issues around tourism in, in, in any case because the collections were drawn from the likes Ashmole actually visiting and bringing back artifacts or maybe stealing artifacts. <laughs> um, souvenirs. Souvenirs, <laughs> yes. So, you know, actually bringing back souvenirs as, as remembrances, as, as um, triggers for, for reminding you know, of those experiences that he'd, he'd had before and, and that of course still happens in many ways. But whether or not we could think about, you know, you certainly think about the challenge of that ownership and access to those artifacts as, as part of what you, you now do, don't you? Yes, and um, of course you inevitably you've only got a certain window, as it were, into those ancient worlds through the selection of the pieces that have been made in those actual places. Mm. Um, and that's true whether the early collectors, which were simply just collecting ra almost randomly, to more systematic excavations, where again, people were selecting the final project products as were to arrive at the museum, mm. from which then curators then select again display. Yes. Of course, it's only a 5% yeah. of the material that's actually on display. Mm -hmm. So you're always reducing down 
And that reduction then takes you to a number of objects which stand for the whole. And so again, our visitor has come in, our tourist comes in, and sees the product of tourism in front of them and creates a world around them. And, and that sense of ownership, of course, is, is expressed through those few objects. The, the famous one, of course, the, the famous objects from antiquity, which have absolute meaning for the modern world, are things like the Parthenon sculptures, mm -hmm. where national identity is focused on objects from the past, which may in reality have no direct connection with the present. But nonetheless, it's meaningful but it's meaningful only because they're looking at a select few objects which represent, to our mind, the best. And so again, it becomes a sort of referential circle of meaning. Mm. Um, and those kinds of conversations, the conversations that I would be wanting to have with my tourism students in relation to how we consume places and how we represent places um, and how that is how we behave ethically in those circumstances. Um, and so there is you know, a great connection to it. I mean, when I started talking, when I started my, um, actually starting to really engage with global citizenship within the modules overtly with students, I, I talked to them about Brooks's definition of, um, of uh, global citizenship and got them to talk to one another and started to talk to them about whether or not they felt as though they were global citizens and if so, why did they feel that they were? And because they're quite well travelled, they would often say, yes, of course we're global citizens, we've been here, we've been there, those kinds of things. Then we started to talk about um, their families and the notion of what their own culture was. And of course that became much more nuanced and difficult because in actual fact many of them don't come from families where they are, um, they're both from the same nationality, they have parents from different countries and that they've lived in multiple different countries and when you say to them where is home, they find it very difficult to identify that. Now. And so there's, there's, there are sh much more shifting sands that I, than I think we assume sometimes. And therefore, the approach that they're going to take to being a global citizen within their subject area and the notion of home in the way that we would use in, in tourism um, is, is changing. The complicated thing then came when we started to, to then talk about some of the scaffolding that I thought might need to be in place in order for conversations to be had more extensively about this in the context of tourism. And that was where I started to find a big hole, really, in terms of political change and understanding how the world had become the way it was. So their historical understanding of globalisation and of trading and of the way the world has moved to become more globalised was really, really thin. And that's partly possibly because of um, these, the curriculum at school level, although these were students from multiple different, you know, I have in time in the last group I had 26 different nationalities in the class and so, you know, I'm not making a, a, an assumption about any particular uh, regime, but their knowledge and their engagement with history was quite weak. And their knowledge and engagement about how the world is working now is quite weak. Um, and that they actually, although well, we talk marvellously about having a globalised world, actually their spheres of influence, even though they come from lots of different countries, tend to be quite small. And so it came to me to start thinking, actually there is really something in getting them to engage with 
about history that would really make it powerful for them to also start to think about their own identity within the context of how the world has changed. Yes. So if you could say something a bit about how the museum tells those stories. Uh, well, I mean, it's, what interests me is that of course, <coughs> this is a, such a recent phenomenon. Mm. I don't mean globalization, <laughs> but, but the idea of, of being able to to tell those stories, mm. particularly in a museum setting. Uh, and of course, scholarship has been, been talking about the world systems theory since the 60s and 70s. Um, but it's only really in the last decade that museums have, in a sense, started to address this. Partly, I think, because, as I said initially, they, they're all, most museums grow organically as the collections come in, and they have to find space to display them. So the connectedness between objects is often lost. And then you're, you're, they're separated further by the compartmentalization of scholarship. So for example, in my world, we divide ancient Egypt from the ancient Near East, even though clearly they're <laughs> next door to each other and talk to each other for thousands of years. So th those were barriers which need to be broken down. And, and I think we're now beginning to think because we're catching the scholarship in a sense of those stories and how to tell them. <coughs> and we have the advantage of the Ashimori in that now we've got spaces where they're geographically adjacent to each other. And we now need to build on that to connect, create those bridges which existed in antiquity, which as they do today. And so that the visitor will be able to see that we're not dealing with, with isolated entities, but that there was constant flux. And that globalization in a sense is not a new thing, that this has been going on for millennia. And we can take just one or two stories to make the point. And that, if you know, students come in, children come in, still able to at key stage two at the moment at least, and look at the ancient Egyptians, they're presented not just with the Egyptians, but the fact that they're talking to the Greeks, and I think to the Romans, and also to the people from ancient Iraq. Mm. And, and they're learning from each other, and they're sharing and that these aren't compartmentalised at all. So it's an exciting learning point. I think, I think that notion of, um, of stories to be told though is an absolute godsend for students being able to engage with what's going on because they understand storytelling yes. so much better than being presented with artefacts where they are expected to make those links than themselves. Now you might say that that's the story as it's interpreted from your particular perspective, but even so it gives them an opportunity to start thinking about how they relate to those stories and how the development of tourism, which is a relatively recent mm -hmm. phenomenon in this current format, actually has its origins in trade actually has its origins in exchange and how the, the way that we are um, progressing, the way tourism is used as a, a generator of um, economic uh, wealth or it's attempted to be used for that um, is something that is not unusual. You know, this is something that has been used over a period of time. It's just much more intensified now. Um, <coughs> I was particularly um, engaged when I went to, to the Ashmole um, in the way that I could see other people using that museum and the links that, you know, the links that they would generate with the artifacts in a way that they wouldn't before. So I'm hoping that the students um, are going to start doing that as well in relation to, to um, tourism. Well, here, I mean, ultimately it's the questions that are asked, isn't it? Because yes. the objects on their own are, are mute, they're behind glass, removed. They are, as we were saying earlier, just one tiny fragment of 
an interconnected whole story. And so there needs to be those key stories that help to guide students, visitors, yes. to ask questions yes. and, and, and follow those connections. One of the things you said to me as well that's about identity, <coughs> that um, you need to have the music moment, you? because people do want to have access to these objects because they help them understand their own identities in the world, but perhaps their identity is, is not very clear to them. How, explain to me how that happens. Um, well, one good example is an object that's Pyotan's mantle, which is uh, part of the original collection that was given in the 17th century. Um, it came from North America. And this belonged, it was actually a wall hanging which came from um, Virginia and part of the, one of the local tribes. Very ceremonial and important objects, which was actually given to a visiting European as a gift of friendship. We then brought it back to the museum. Those, that tribe, basically on the verge of extinction, following six, from the 17th century onwards through the, the terrible traumas that they suffered as a result of European engagement with North America. And now that object had holds great symbolic meaning to the remnants of those people. Mm -hmm. They've lost all knowledge of the symbolism and the rituals that went with it. But nonetheless, they're creating new ones in order to maintain that sense of identity. So for that particular group of people, that one object sitting in Oxford, not wanted back, it's, they, in a sense, they're, they're saying, thank you, thank, you, thank you for caring for it. And at the end of the day, it was given as a, as a gift. But nonetheless, it has to be available to them so that they can maintain that sense of identity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so you know, we'll, we will take it out when the elders come so that they can engage with it, so they, can, they can share with that very powerful object, which yes. is one among many. Yes. I mean, there was something else in the conversation that we had about, um, when we were talking before, about how um, you know, we make assumptions that these things are just things for us to gaze upon and don't necessarily have any you know, embedded meaning when we go into the museum. And you gave an example um, of giving a gallery talk to some accountants, I think, oh, that's right. yes. who, has, who were coming to um, a conference, I think, that Oxford, maybe tell Yes, story. yes, okay, yes, yeah. yes, that, that was an interesting experience, actually, yeah. This, um, the side Business School had a conference um, on, I, th I think the, the background was um, actually media relations to the financial world. Um, and, uh, and they chose the Ashmolean as the venue to have their after-conference drinks. They, there was no discussion at all about engaging with the objects. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a venue, it was a space. And nice one, new architecture, but there was an interest in the object. And the uh, development people in the, in the museum rang me up and said, oh, we're, we're looking for um, curators to, as well as to stand around and engage <laughs> with these people. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, well, I, I, you know, what I, I don't want to do that because I, you know, these, small these, talk these, at the end of somebody else's these people want to have a drink and, you know, they, <laughs> so I thought, well, why don't we give them gallery talk? actually show them objects and, and part of the collection that I'm responsible for is the world's earliest writing. Um, so 3000 BC, people are grappling with the idea of how to do spreadsheets. And what we have a clay tablets divided up into Excel charts with numbers in them. <laughs> and so I took these people to those objects and said, they were asking exactly the same questions as you were trying to deal with in your conference, the idea of how to take 
imagery, information, and make it meaningful and literally memorable. Um, and suddenly, they saw that they were at the end, or halfway through or whatever, in a 3,000 year, 5,000 year now, process of asking the same questions, but just approaching it in different ways and different technology. And, and I think that did, for many of them, they, they really started to think, gosh, it's not just about the last few years that, um, that, that these problems existed, that we've been dealing with them, with them for, again, globally, for, for thousands of years, but just in slightly different ways. Yes. And, I, and I, I, well, I know that, that sort of, in a sense, opened their eyes to, to yes. that, that sort of notion. I, you know, I, I think it would be really interesting, wouldn't it, if maybe in um, business school we could start to think about other ways of um, approaching disciplinary context with, with some of these, some of these things. Um, I mean, Paul and I are hoping to work together next year with first years in doing context of international tourism um, to use the museum as a resource. But, you know, what I have been doing so far with my students is really trying to help them understand the world and their place in it. Um, but I don't see that it's something for me to do to them. It's something for them to experience and then try and make sense of. And people this morning were talking about um, their own perspectives and um, the stories that, that students have to tell. One of the things that's been quite powerful is that in doing this and talking, you know, discovering that they don't know very much even about 20th century history, is that I have had to give them some of my history too. I've had to share some of that history with them too, in order for them to even understand a bit of the world as it was when I was a child. Mm -hmm. So experiences of my childhood holidays as opposed to experiences of their childhood holidays. And then we start to talk about, you know, the real meat of the um, of one of the modules, which is about you know, it's ranged around a question is as can tourism be a force for good in the alleviation of poverty? So real question where you know their issues of feeling responsible and and, um, and how they make judgments or not about others could could fit in, but without any of that other understanding, I was finding it really really difficult to even open those conversations. But opening a bit of the history about my own life. And also some research, I, some visual research I have done with people who have had their first travel experiences in the early 1950s, just just after the Second World War, when we would be looking at photographs, even of um, people on, people in England having a holiday, where they'd be looking at um, they'd be sitting on the beach and children would be sitting in their school uniform with their caps on and we had um, video recordings of some of the interviews that we did that we showed the students where um, people would be talking about these kinds of holidays that, that they had as, as children or when they had their own young children that they were, were taking away and they said we only ever had, we, you know, we only ever had one set of clothes apart from uniform for them. And the students are so shocked by this. They're so shocked that that is our recent history because they have so much and they are so embedded as consumers that shaking their viewpoint by giving them a different view and also by saying, actually, I didn't, you know, it didn't bother me. I didn't have anything because actually had nobody had anything and therefore you weren't looking over your shoulder. And then you can start to talk to them about how that might feel by rich Westerners going into poverty stricken parts of the world as tourists and how that might change what happens in those locations.
convictions, and certainly there's evidence of crime and, those, um, and um, uh, violence and things also in some of those locations because of that disparity between those that have been and those that don't have. But again, it's not necessarily something that is new, but which is new to them because they're living in such a differently shaped world that is such a recent development um, that we haven't... Um, it's difficult for me to engage with their, their world in lots of respects, and it's difficult for them to engage in the world that tourism has come from, and that makes it difficult for them to visualise, envision a future that could be more responsible. And so I think this thread, this embedding some sense of history and where we come from, and, and then developing some sense of who they are and their identity within that, has to be part of the project, really. Yeah, I, 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 I just made me think about it. the museum, its role probably, in a sense, was an early form of television. It enabled you to, to at least try and see different worlds. And of course, you know, I deal with the ancient world that the museum is displaying as well. It's an ethnographic material, yeah. anthropological material. So, in a, in a sense, there was an attempt to, to reveal different cultures. And those cultures behind glass, you're separated from them. So you stand and you view, you look from a distance, separated from them and safe. And that's what television does, in a sense. Mm -hmm. You can see the has done as well. You can see the was my point in a sense. You know, the, the, the globe is there for everybody to think that they're familiar with it, and yet you're still separated from it. And then, as a tourist, you might go to these places. Are you then expecting the same sort of separation? Mm -hmm. and, and what I would like to see in museums is a greater engagement with thinking about the reality, as well as bring the objects from behind the glass out so that they become living things that humans created and were part of their living culture yeah. and which had value and meaning um, and, and of course we do that all the time with um, our students and archaeology and so but it would be great I think to have some of your students think yes. about it in the same way. It, yeah. might, be, it might be really good if we could actually get some student groups together as well, yes. to actually be able to have a conversation. Um, certainly I've been talking to Shelley Sachs in, in Social Sculpture about how we might get some of the tourism students and the Social Sculpture students to work together to actually try and visualise some of the issues and, and the, the problems that we're trying to solve, really. Um, because you know, tourism in its current model is unsustainable completely and um, we need to, to be developing people who can think differently. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had the democratisation of travel, so-called, by low-cost airlines, which actually is not really democ democratic at all. It's actually even more elitist in, in some respects in that the democratisation of travel, making travel cheaper, has not actually resulted in um, there being very many more people travelling, it's just resulted in the same people travelling. Mm -hmm. um, and so that actually makes it even more isolating for those people who don't travel. So we talk about international tourism a lot and what that means. But now it's interesting as we've started to talk to this to, to students about this that um, actually the conclusions that they're coming up with is that actually we need to be more local with tourism. The difficulties, of course, are that um, in the poorest areas of the world there is no potential for a domestic tourism market or there is no um, resource really for a, a tourism market and they have to have 
international money coming in in the same way that we have, you know, that there was trade in, in the first place. So, you know, it's a very difficult and complex problem that they're trying to address. I, I, sorry, but, yeah. so I, was one, I wonder yeah. how, how much you feel that cultures are, in a sense, being fossilised or being created in an image of what the tourists would like to see. Gosh, I mean, this is, there's a massive literature on this, which is sort of loosely labelled authenticity. Yes. Um, and there's <coughs> lots of analysis about um, discussion about staged authenticity in particular, where you will have um, performances which perhaps have been invented for the tourists, um, purely for consumption, and you might say, in some respects, that doesn't matter. And, you know, some of the students say, well, actually, it doesn't matter, does it? Because it's just a transaction. It's just a way to get more money from them. And actually, they're developing tourism because that's what they want. That's, that's the exchange that they primarily want, the economic exchange. Um, but in fact, it has unforeseen social and cultural impacts that they don't want necessarily. On the other hand, there is a counter-argument that sometimes some of these traditions that have been lost have been revived because there is a purpose yes. for them. Um, and the purpose had been slightly lost, but actually part of it, the performative, has been really, um, you know, is, is really important. Um, but being better equipped to be able to challenge the kinds of things that are happening in tourism is really important for me. I can remember going to the um, Gambia and, and uh, being part of a um, tour that was put on by the Gambia Experience, which is a company which pronounces itself to be very responsible and um, they uh, offer um, some tours where you, know, you get a, a briefing about cultural behaviour, you know, not wearing very short clothes, you know, it's a Muslim country, country, so being sensitive about all of those things, which were completely ignored by most of the tourists who, who went on them. But then when you were, we actually had the visits to, to the places that they were taking us on this tour, um, one of them was a maternity home. So the maternity home was presenting itself as a proxy tourist attraction in order to get donations from the visitor. And what a dangerous thing that is to do. Um, and some of the, the tourists who were just ordinary people in the package tour room got very distressed about it that too. So they were actually thinking about it, but just said their response to that was we won't come back to the gambler again. Which again is, you know, is counterproductive. Um, so enabling students to think about that kind of issue and to come up with some kind of different model is crucial, but they can't do it if they haven't got the underpinning understanding and I don't want you know we talk about values based education and I was at a conference um, earlier this year which was um, the tourism education futures international conference which was really about global citizenship but also a lot of conversation focused around values based education and lots of things that like, well we shouldn't be telling the students what their values are and things but you can help them develop their own values and to question their own values and to come to some um, place where they feel that they can justify and um, develop their values in relation to the, the practice that they are undertaking. So I'm hoping that they're going to be able to work um, to explore yes. This as an idea of our institutions, your your institution, 
with your resource and the way you have telling your stories, interacting with students coming to this with a series of problems in their minds, but developing and the structures. Yes, but I, I mean, I think what's been so exciting in a sense is, is that you just say the word authenticity. Mm -hmm. You could set a group of students with, with that word. Mm -hmm. And in the museum, of course, authenticity is everything. People come to the museum because they because want to be authentic. authentic. They don't want to see replicas. Car scatter is interesting, but it's not the real thing. And I suppose that's certainly true of why people want to travel as well. There are large numbers of them want to go and see the authentic thing, whether it's the performance mm. or the object. And, and so it's exactly the same. And so whether you, again, how do you display the authentic? How do you make it authentic? Is it an artificial authenticity? It's, it, all these things are exactly and it's trying. A, and it's a changing, um, you know, I don't think authenticity is something that can be set. No. Really. No. Um, it's something that is contextualized. Yeah. And it, within the museum setting, of course, there should be no, there's a dominant voice. There's no no culture which is highlighted. The 19th century approach is supposed Greece, classical mm -hmm. Greece at the end of everything. Mm -hmm. Now we see that as a connected world. Mm -hmm. So that in itself, helps then that you can come with authenticity but it doesn't matter where you stand to mm -hmm. ask the question. Well and also if we can somehow work it so that you know while I'm trying to engage them with what's happening in the world at the moment. So what's happening in Greece at the moment is yeah. particularly relevant and actually make those linkages to where they come from, where they kind of feel and how they might therefore envisage a future is really could be really powerful. Yes, yes. 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 So these are wonderfully rich concepts which are um, being visually um, demonstrated and the potential for engagement as well that we both talked about, that you want to engage visitors, engage students, um, and engage tourists, and engage members of the tourist industry so that it's not looking into a screen or a block of glass, it's not watching television, it's actually um, critical engagement with it. Mm -hmm are all absolutely um, germane to the things that we've been talking about today. So if I could then open this out to discussion from any thoughts, any comments, any questions at all or for Lynn to open out the discussion to, uh, to, to, to you. Do you want like to start with a comment, question, observation? Yeah, thanks, it's very interesting. I will uh, I wonder, uh, thinking of the domestic <laughs> market and thinking uh, of Oxford in particular, uh, and I was reminded of a project that I did with Beef up in Leeds and worked with some heritage institutions in terms of community engagement and international students working you know, with museums. Um, uh, how much do you consider also Oxford itself as a place of sort of multiculturalism, of uh, sort of those in its ownership? of a diverse community which could come into this place of, uh, uh, you know, or interplay between, you know, the institution, university, institution, museum, but also the, uh, the students who live here in, in this community, uh, and, you know, the sort of Oxford community here. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of that, or what is that Well, again, in the, in the transformation, like the, old, the old Ashmole, in a sense, was there for the student body. As, as a teaching resource, mm -hmm. with the doors just only slightly ajar. Um, now, of course, we're, we're looking very much at Oxford, which is our primary <laughs> audience, mm -hmm. um, and the diversity of, of Oxford is, is part of that, it's particularly through exhibitions. Um, one that's just recently closed was uh, an exhibition on contemporary Chinese art, uh, Xu Bing, um, which again opened up. Uh, 
we were looking to see what whether that might engage with the local Chinese community. It didn't interest mm -hmm. me. You know, they, 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 this was this was an exhibition which would have gone down very well in New York, <laughs> but not in Oxford. So we're still on that learning curve and trying to to identify how best to engage with different communities. Um, one of our more successful ventures is what's called Late Friday Openings, um, which, are, uh, uh, which are actually curated in a sense by the student community. So different faculties or different uh, student groups um, will come up with a theme and then devise an entire evening of activities and displays and performances around that. And we've had China evening, uh, uh, a classical evening, um, which have been hugely successful in drawing in oh, thousands, literally thousands of people for three hours on a Friday evening, last Friday of the month, it says advertising. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but those, those are the ways that we're starting to bring new audiences into the institution. And it's through being relevant to what people want, in a sense, and, and the objects then just help to illuminate that. So we're beginning the process, I hope. I mean, we, we do use Oxford as a lab, really, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, and certainly, you know, the other modules that I'm teaching, in particular, um, festivals and cultural events, um, engage with Oxford Inspires and the student and engage with Oxford Inspires, which is the cultural agency, which is now quite well connected with the tourism agency, one of the few where culture and tourism actually have come together as an organisation, um, to actually think about cultural events and the means that they have. And they do that in Oxford, but, also, but this year they've gone out and looked at events elsewhere, but they're bringing back what they have found to the cultural agency. I just wanted to thank you both for what was a really very, very interesting uh, dialogue. And, and myself and my colleague have been sitting here thinking about ways that we might use this in our teaching. It's been yeah. recorded. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, in a sense, I mean, whether the students are doing tourism or whatever the students are doing, clearly the, the, the museum you know, poses this amazing opportunity for us, doesn't it, for, for engagement. And it's given me some fresh ideas about how to do that. One thing that I was thinking about as I was listening to this was this idea of identity um, and the changing way in which we see identity, which also provides a kind of meta-narrative opportunity for getting students to think about understandings of identity beyond um, just what is going on in the museum. Because, you know, arguably you could say that we're now living in a time where identity has become more central. But understanding who we are and where we come from is being done in a different way to ways that it was done in the past. And it occurred to me that that's a kind of critical engagement to get students really thinking about, you know, what kind of dialogues are you having in the museum about how to bring that to life with them, for them, about trying to break down those kind of power relationships between the different areas of history and trying to make those more seamless, you know. And the other thing that really struck me was this idea of, of critical engagement over how people access tourism and its unevenness, I mean, that's something that I, I'll go away thinking about, those examples that you gave. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of, you know, my own experience, I'm more familiar with the Balkans, of this concept of dark tourism yes. as well, yes. of people visiting places where, you know, horrific things have happened mm -hmm. and trying to make sense of those, which again comes back to this sort of identity and the need to understand and reconnect <laughs> ourselves. I mean, it, it, all of that, I think, you know, there's so much mileage in there for um, students, but also for staff. And I liked the idea of, um, to, for this to work, there has to be some authenticity of relationship between the students and the, the staff. There has to be some revelation. It can't just be um, that it's done from a distance, because in a sense it demands, I think, a more authentic relationship, which I, I found very refreshing to listen to, anyway. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I think... For me, part of that is about building the students' confidence mm -hmm. because actually they're quite, they're not, well, I have found that the students I have not very used to being challenged about those kinds of things. Um, 
Um, or even thinking about them, particularly. Um, or even about being engaged in what the world is happening. They're quite happy to be in the end of the same bubble. And so when you're challenging it, it makes them feel a bit shaky. Mm -hmm. And so finding ways to rebuild mm -hmm. that confidence for them to, to, be, to build their own confidence is in the important part of the process. Really. Mm -hmm. Just a brief point, something Viv said earlier about uh, celebrating festivals and uh, other exotic uh, cultures. And the response, I think, in a certain university community was, why spotlight a certain culture? Because it stops university students, be they from the UAE or China or the UK, from integrating. So by putting a specific culture, be it Chinese or any other, on a pedestal, it creates perhaps some sort of um, obstacle between the different communities living in Oxford. I could be wrong. I probably am. But how do you feel about that, Paul? Is there a great need to have these? I, I think what we're not, I don't, what I hope we're not doing is putting them on pedestals. I hope what we're, we're showing is variety and the fact that um, you don't have to, in a sense, come from that community to engage with it in the same way that you don't have to be an ancient Egyptian to, in a sense, engage with ancient Egypt. Um, it, it, it's there to pose questions mm -hmm. as much as anything, and, and we leave it at that. Um, you did say that the response among the Chinese community here in Oxford was not so strong because perhaps they may have felt their culture was being misrepresented. I did go to yes, that event, ah. and I enjoyed the, the jazz evening, how that relates yes. to ancient China, I don't quite know. And also the, the Chinese inspired, apparently, karaoke room. Now, having lived in, in Japan for just a few years, I suspect there is a, a slight jump necessary to associate China with karaoke. Again, I could be wrong. Some Chinese students. <laughs> well, there we are, you see. Very scary. You know, mind the cultural gap. You know. uh, I didn't, I didn't, I missed that one. Um, Likewise, I gave it a body swerve and uh, just looked at the other yeah. stuff. Yeah. Sorry. I, th I think my question is very like Michael's actually, and I was just wondering about um, uh, representation, um, because obviously we've been talking about artefacts and how artefacts are selected and selected down. Um, and um, is there a danger that um, there's a representation of cultures? that might be along the lines of kind of exotica. Yes. Um, yes. And is, is, there, is there a danger that that will simply reinforce people's kind of essentialized views of, of cultures rather than breaking down barriers? Um, there's an absolute danger of that. Um, you know, I, I talked about identity being vested in specific objects like the Parthenon mm -hmm. cultures because the West has perceived those as the finest thing and therefore they're latched on to because we, we say they should be, in a sense. But building a gallery um, is about trying to avoid creating a spectacle. It's a, as, a, as an archaeologist, as an ancient historian, I'm trying to get as close as I can to the reality of those ancient world, the real people. Now, we'll never get there. We know that. Um, but what we want to do is get people to start thinking about these, not as, as um, necessarily alien worlds that can't be understood, but that there are lots of questions that still need to be answered. Um, and the Ashmolean were, were slightly luckier, I would say, um, at least for my particular area of interest, in that most of the material is archaeological has come out of the ground, selected by archaeologists, true, so it's always a selected view of the past, but it's about the ordinary people. And it's not an, the area I deal with isn't an art collection, which is highlighting what we value aesthetically as important, and creating a, 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 a particular exotic image of the past. But without a doubt, these are absolutely questions which will continue be at the forefront of the debate within museum displays because you're always dealing with a fragment of reality and how you display that, how you interpret it, 
that is going to create an image. So yeah, I, I mean, there's no easy, I don't, there isn't an answer for it I can give you because, because we're, we're all with working with what we've got, in a sense, which is going to obviously give you a, a slant of view. Perhaps it's how you engage with that and the sorts of things you've been presenting as the you know how you how you get people to engage with those is the crucial bit. It's the questions I'm getting. It is, yes, yeah, yeah. but yeah. that's got to be done so carefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So just um, uh, just one last question, or we're allowed to spin over just a little bit. Who am I to say we can't spin over? <laughs> so Val and then Robert. Well, thank you for that. I, I found it actually fascinating the description of how you're creating the, the new Ashmolean because it's really shifted my perception of what's happening in the museum or other museums perhaps as well. And a lot of our talk today is all about values, whose values, what values, global values, are there such things? And I'm, I'm just wondering, is it possible to connect with the Ashmolean um, curation in terms of visiting that and engaging with it in terms of looking at the values of these societies and these cultures across the world and across the ages and perhaps trying to answer some of our questions, I don't know. It's, it's set me up on that track. So. Yeah, I mean, thinking about the values of those societies is mm. an anthropologist's mm. um, endeavour, I suppose. Mm. And anthropology is one of the strands, one of the disciplines that feeds into understanding tourism. So, it is something that um, we look at, but more in terms of actually where we look at it is in developing countries where um, communities are trying to develop tourism and their governments will be um, taking money from foreign investors in order to build, build the infrastructure to allow people to get into the country but actually the values of the communities that are going to be disrupted or hosting these, these communities, are, are, are these um, tourists are hardly ever discussed, mm -hmm. actually. Um, not, not by the home country and not by people themselves, really. Um, and certainly not by um, tour operators when mm -hmm. um, they come in, because However much we have the responsible approach, actually it's still very much embedded in a transactional kind of engagement rather than giving ownership to the host community and power to the community mm -hmm. for what they do. But certainly I'm trying to sort of but not about values in the national understanding about values. Well, I think that's an interesting comment because, of course, we, we don't know the values of the, of the ancient world. Um, so, I mean, in the same way that the, the, the elite, in a sense, are imposing values on, on the, the yeah. your notion, we are imposing values on, on, on the, the material from the ancient world. I mean, the museum displays are created by us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're in our image, <laughs> in a sense. And you know, yes, as archaeologists and historians, you know, we're, we're trying to get beyond that as much as we can, but it's impossible, really, at the end of the day. So again, there's parallels between <laughs> uh, tourism today and how we try to, to visit the ancient world um, so I just wanted, um, and it was particularly Paul's answer to the, to the last two questions or, or the comments that made me think about this, um, to maybe connect the dot to our larger conversation here over the last couple of days, is, is what you described in some of the uncertainty and the tension of the work of museums um, is the work of curriculum. Uh, museums are trying to teach us something, right? Um, that makes it a curriculum. Mm -hmm. But it's also uh, the, the impossibility, right, and of, of, uh, of uh, there are no guarantees, mm -hmm. right? In other words, we can try as hard as we want to teach a particular mm -hmm. thing, but there's no guarantee that that is in fact what we'll get learned. So there, there's some uncertainty there. 
And then also the idea that curriculum is always exclusive, right? In the sense that you can't teach everything. Right? So again, you kind of describe how museum curators make decisions. And they make decisions um, based on their values, right, of what might be important in terms of what they want to put forward and teach. And I think the same is true as we think about the more critical perspectives of tourism. So it just struck me that without using the word, I thought that was a, a very nuanced way to think about curriculum, which is a piece of what we're trying to connect over the, you know, the day and a half that we're here. That was a wonderful summary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the threads that are being pulled together by this. So thank you very, very much for a very inspiring, thought-provoking session, which I think projects into the future and shows perfect example of how Teacher or join up. Thank you so much.